Hello and welcome to the Gospel of Judas, the rediscovery of the earliest Gnostic gospel. Brought to you by the History Department, the Clio Society, and the College of Arts and Sciences at The Ohio State University, and by the Bexley Public Library. My name is Nick Breifogel. I'm an Associate Professor of History and Director of the Goldberg Center for Excellence in Teaching, and I'll be your host and moderator today. Thank you so very much for joining us. In 2006, a small group of historians startled the world by announcing the discovery and publication of a Gospel of Judas. In this Coptic text from the second century, Jesus engages in a series of conversations with his disciples and with Judas, explaining the origin of the cosmos and its rulers, the existence of another holy race, and the coming end of the current world order. 16 years later, we can now see the true significance of this strange text, which reveals to us the amazing diversity of Christianity, only 100 years after Jesus. Today, we'll explore the story of this gospel and the early history of Gnostic mythology. Let's take a moment to get to know our speaker today, David Brackey. David Brackey is a professor and Joe R. Engel Chair in the History of Christianity in the Department of History at The Ohio State University. He received his PhD in Religious Studies from Yale and taught at Indiana University for 19 years before coming to Ohio State in 2012. He studies and teaches the history and literature of ancient Christianity from its origins through the fifth century with special interests in asceticism, monasticism, Gnosticism, biblical interpretation, and Egyptian Christianity. He's the author of several books, including The Gnostics, Myth, Ritual, and Diversity in Early Christianity, and the newly published The Gospel of Judas, a new translation with introduction and commentary. And he's currently the president of the International Association for Coptic Studies. With that introduction, let me lay out the plan. Professor Brackey will begin with the talk about the Gospel of Judas. And then he'll take your questions and we'll open things up for discussion. If you're interested in asking a question, please write it in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We'll do our best to answer as many questions we, as we can. We had several questions come in during registration uh, and we look forward to receiving more uh, during the webinar. Now, without further ado, let me pass you over to Professor David Brackey, who will take us on an exploration of the Gospel of Judas, the rediscovery of the earliest Gnostic gospel. Over to you, Professor Brackey. Thank you, Nick. And uh, thanks to the Clio Society for inviting me and the College of Arts and Sciences for its support. This is actually a great day to do this because it's coincidentally the official publication day of my new book on the Gospel of Judas shown here. I'm afraid that it's really aimed at advanced students and scholars who know ancient languages. And so I don't encourage anyone else to get it. Plus it's $65, which is a price that only Judas Iscariot could love. So um, I'll give you a plug for another more reasonable book in a bit. So let's talk about the Gospel of Judas. The Gospel of Judas was first published in the spring of 2006. It surprised a lot of people, but historians of Christianity had long known that the existence of such a gospel was possible. Around the year 180 AD, the Christian Bishop of Lyon in France, Irenaeus, had briefly mentioned a gospel with this title. He claimed that a group of Christians named the Gnostics had fabricated it. Still, even many modern historians doubted that Christians would name a gospel for the disciple who, according to the New Testament, had betrayed Jesus. Maybe they wondered this Judas is actually the disciple known as Judas Thomas, the one who wrote the New Testament epistle of Jude, which is really Judas, and the one after whom the gospel, according to Thomas, is named. No, it turned out the gospel of Judas really is about Judas Iscariot. The gospel does not claim to have come from Judas. It's not the gospel according to Judas, but it's a gospel about Judas, about his knowledge of what Jesus really means, about his difference from the other disciples, and about his ultimate role in the future reorganization of the cosmos. This gospel explains that Jesus's death, which Judas played a major role in causing, will bring an end to the world order that we currently know 
It will open the path to salvation for the saved and place this cosmos under new divine management. The Coptic Codex that contains the Gospel of Judah seems to have been discovered with three other books in the late 1970s near Almenia in Egypt. The other three books found in the cave near Almenia contain a Greek mathematical text, a copy of the biblical book Exodus in Greek, and a copy of the letters of St. Paul in Coptic. The codex containing Judas was probably copied in the early 300s, but we know that the original Greek text was composed in the middle of the 100s because Irenaeus mentions it around 180. But can we be sure that the Gospel of Judas found in the 20th century is the same Gospel of Judas that Irenaeus knew in the second century? We can't know this 100% for certain because Irenaeus never quotes from the gospel, but he does describe it briefly. Here's what he says. And furthermore, they, these are certain groups among the Gnostics, say that Judas, the betrayer, was thoroughly acquainted with these things, and he alone was acquainted with the truth as no others were. And so he accomplished the mystery of the betrayal. By him, all things, both earthly and heavenly, were thrown into dissolution. And they bring forth a fabricated work to this effect, which they entitle the Gospel of Judas. As we'll see, this description matches well what the newly discovered gospel is like. Judas, we'll find out, does know the truth in a way that no one else in the gospel does. And he does cause all things in this universe to go into dissolution by sending Jesus to his death. So even though a direct quotation would make us feel more confident, nearly all historians agree that the text found in Egypt is a Coptic translation of the gospel that Irenaeus would have read in the original Greek back in the 100s. Even though the Coptic manuscript was found in the late 1970s, scholars did not publish the Gospel of Judas until 2006, but that's not their fault. Instead, a series of middlemen and antiquities dealers prevented scientific conservation and study of the text as they tried to get as much money as they could for it. I regret to say that a man from Ohio was particularly negligent in this regard. As a result, the codex is badly damaged and fragmentary, as you can see from this photo. After the initial publication in 2006, additional fragments were discovered and published in 2010. If you want to read a translation of the Gospel of Judas, you want to be sure to have one that includes these fragments from 2010. On your screen, you see two anthologies that contain such translations. You'll see the second one I was involved in. So there's the self-promotional part of this whole thing. Unlike the Gospels in the New Testament, the Gospel of Judas does not tell us much about Jesus's life and ministry. There are no stories of Jesus being born. There are no travels around Galilee, no miracles. The author just says that Jesus performed signs and great wonders for the salvation of humanity. The Gospel narrates a series of conversations between Jesus and his disciples and between Jesus and Judas. These conversations take place in the days before Jesus's death. It's what scholars call a dialogue gospel. During these conversations, Jesus deprecates all the disciples, including Judas, but he never criticizes Judas as harshly as he does the other disciples. None of the other disciples know anything true about Jesus, and Jesus compares them to evil priests who are leading their followers to their deaths, as we'll see. Eventually, Jesus delivers a long speech of revelation to Judas. Jesus explains to Judas the nature of God and the origin and destiny of this cosmos. After this revelation, Jesus departs towards heaven on a cloud. But next, he is with his disciples in the upper room of some house, presumably sharing the Last Supper. Outside that room, G Judas meets with Jewish leaders, accepts their money, and hands Jesus over to them. Then the gospel ends. The author expects that we know what happened next. So this gospel assumes that readers are familiar with the gospels of the New Testament, 
you appreciate the meaning of certain scenes better if you have read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Consider the opening scene. Jesus comes upon the disciples offering thanksgiving over the bread, and he laughs at them. The disciples ask Jesus, teacher, why are you laughing at our prayer of thanksgiving? What did we do? This is what's right. And Jesus replies, I'm not laughing at you. You don't do this by your own will. By this, your God receives praise. Now, the word used for thanksgiving here is Eucharist. So when the disciples are portrayed as saying thanksgiving over the bread, it looks like they are celebrating the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper, even though that would be anachronistic because Jesus has not yet instituted the Lord's Supper. In any case, Jesus mocks this ritual as offering praise to what he calls your God. This is the first in indication that the Gospel of jo Judas is Gnostic. For a key belief of the Gnostics is that the God that other Christians worship, the God of the Old Testament, is not the ultimate God who sent Jesus. I'll come back to that point in a little bit. As the scene continues, Jesus' pronouncement that the God the disciples worship is not his God were angers the disciples, and Jesus challenges them. Let whoever is strong among you people present the perfect human being and stand before my face. In other words, Jesus wants to know whether any of the disciples belong to the saved people, those who are perfect, and whether any of them can display their perfection before him. None of the disciples dare to answer Jesus except for Judas. Judas stands before Jesus and says, I know who you are and where you have come from. You have come from the immortal eon of the Barbalo. But as for the one who sent you, its name I am not worthy to proclaim. This, we shall see, is the correct answer. Jesus comes from a realm above this cosmos, from an eon called Barbalo. An eon is an emanation from the divine, and the Barbalo eon comes from the ultimate true God, whom Judas is not worthy to name. Now, here's how the Gospel of Judas describes what happens next. Jesus, because he knew that Judas was thinking about the rest of the exalted things as well, said to him, separate from them, and I will tell you the mysteries of the kingdom, not so that you will go there, but so that you will be much grieved. Notice that on the one hand, Jesus commends Judas and promises to tell him mysteries that he has not told anyone else, mysteries about the kingdom. On the other hand, Jesus tells Judas that he will not go to that kingdom himself, but he will be grieved. This scene is almost certainly modeled after an episode that occurs in three of the New Testament gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In the New Testament scene, Jesus asks the disciples, who do you say that I am? They give various answers, but only Simon Peter answers properly. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. That's the version in Matthew. Now, especially in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus's reaction to Peter's correct identification is ambiguous. On the one hand, Jesus commends Peter, calling him blessed, the recipient of divine revelation and the rock on which Jesus will build his church. On the other hand, when Jesus foretells his suffering and death, Peter protests, and then Jesus rebukes him severely. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. The scene in Judas echoes that in Matthew. In both cases, Jesus poses a challenge to the disciples, and in both cases, only one disciple steps forward and correctly identifies Jesus' divine identity, Peter in the Gospel of Matthew and Judas in the Gospel of Judas. And in both cases, Jesus commends that disciple, saying that he receives a special revelation, and then Jesus condemns the disciple as Satan or someone who will not enter the kingdom. The author of the Gospel of Judas surely wants the reader to remember the scene in Matthew and to make the comparison. Judas replaces Peter. He's the disciple who knows more than the others, who is both insightful 
and yet can be rebuked. And Judas's identification of Jesus as coming from the Barbalo Eon and a God that he cannot name contrasts with Peter calling Jesus the Christ and Son of God. To understand this gospel, then, we need to understand these two basic contrasts between Judas and Peter, as well as the other disciples, and between these two confessions of, of who Jesus really is. I'm going to turn to the second question first. According to Judas, Jesus, Jesus has come from the immortal eon of the Barbalo and has been sent by a God whose name he is not worthy to say. Later in the gospel, in a long revelation speech to Judas, Jesus explains the view of God and the cosmos that lies behind Judas' statement. What Jesus tells is one version of the Gnostic myth, the basic narrative of God and creation that Gnostic Christians taught during the second and third centuries. Jesus explains that the ultimate source of everything, the true God of all things, is the great invisible spirit. Not even angels have seen the invisible spirit, and it has not been called by any name. This is why Judas says that he cannot proclaim the name of the one who sent Jesus. Now, no one may be able to see or name the invisible spirit, but the invisible spirit unfolds into or emanates from itself a series of lower aspects or manifestations of itself, which the gospel calls eons and sometimes angels. These aspects of God can be known by human beings, but only by those who are saved and gain knowledge, or in Greek, gnosis. Hence the name of this group of Christians. They are Gnostics because they have gnosis or knowledge of true divinity. The first eon to emanate from the invisible spirit, Jesus calls a luminous cloud. But we know from other Gnostic works that this first eon is also called the Barbalo. This is an obscure name and historians do not agree on where it may have come from. The Barbalo eon, sometimes also called forethought, is the eon closest to the invisible spirit and it is the immortal eon from which Jesus has come. So Judas declares early in the gospel. From the Barbalo eon emanate a series of additional eons, some of which are named and most of which are not. The Gnostic vision of God is complex and intricate, but the details aren't important for our purposes here. What is important is that the Gnostic myth in the Gospel of Judas presents a view of God that is both single and multiple, remote and accessible a remote and entirely unitary God, the invisible spirit, expands into more accessible and multiple divine aspects, which are both separate from and the same as the one God. Now, all this may sound very complicated to us. We're used to thinking of Christians believing in just one God, or maybe one God who is also three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But that last idea, the idea of the Trinity, did not just pop up when Christianity began. Instead, Christians spent centuries debating how there could be just one God, and yet also other aspects or manifestations of God, such as Jesus and the Holy Spirit. The Gnostics drew on the Old Testament, as well as pagan mythology and philosophy, to answer this question. For example, they drew on contemporary Platonism. Platonists of the second century taught that there must be only one God, but that this God must also be so spiritual and unitary that we cannot know that God directly. Instead, God must emanate or overflow into lower aspects of himself, which we can know. Both the Gnostics and the Christians we call Orthodox adapted and, and applied this insight to the Christian God. For all early Christians, God is both single and multiple. Most Christians of the second century limited God's multiplicity to just two, the Father who cannot be known directly and the Son who makes him known. Or for some, there are three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the Gnostics did not. They argued that God emanates into many eons or aspects of himself, more than just 
2. But everything I have said thus far applies to God in and of himself. According to the Gnostics, the cosmos in which we live is separate from God and not ruled by God directly. Instead, Jesus tells Judas, the universe in which we live is perishable and corruptible, and it's ruled by a lower divine being with two names, Nabro and Yaldabaoth. Yaldabaoth was appointed by the higher divine realm to rule over the chaos in which we dwell. He is assisted by his own set of angels, also called rulers. Yaldabaoth and his fellow rulers gave some order to the chaos of the material universe. It's Yaldabaoth who created the world in which we live, and so it's Yaldabaoth who, in the book of Genesis, is the creator god. In other words, the God of the Old Testament, the God of Israel, the God worshipped by Jews and most Christians, is not the ultimate God, but a lower ruler named Yaldabaoth. And even more, Yaldabaoth rebelled against the invisible spirit. His other name, Nebro, means apostate. Yaldabaoth, or Nebro, wants everyone to worship him alone, not the invisible spirit. Yaldabaoth and his rulers created the first human beings, Adam and Eve, and it's one of the rulers who placed a limit on how long human beings might live. But the higher gods, the invisible spirit, the Barbelo, and so on, did not leave human beings in complete servitude to Yaldabaoth and his cronies. As Jesus says to Judas, God caused knowledge, that is gnosis, to be given to Adam and those with him in order that the king of chaos and Hades might not rule over them. Yaldabaoth is the king of chaos and Hades from, which, from whom the saved people must be liberated. Yaldabaoth, the god of the Old Testament and creator of this world, is not the true god, say the Gnostics, but a lesser ruler. And yet, this is the god to which the disciples were offering thanksgiving at the beginning of the gospel. So Jesus was laughing because they are worshiping the wrong God, Yaldabaoth. That's your God, Jesus told them. The greatest theological contrast between the gospel of Judas and the views of most early Christians lies in this notion that the God of the Old Testament is not the ultimate God and what that says about Jesus. The gospels of the New Testament identify Jesus as the son of the God of Israel, the creator God of the Old Testament the Messiah. The Gospel of Judas, however, says that Jesus comes from a God higher and more spiritual than that God. It is, in fact, an error, a laughable mistake, to worship the God of Israel as the father of Jesus. This brings us to the contrast between Judas and Peter and the other disciples as leaders. The Gospel of Judas presents the disciples, except for Judas, as mistaken and confused about the truth. Therefore, they are leading people to their spiritual deaths. At one point in the Gospel, the disciples report to Jesus that they have had a nightmare. They saw a large house with a great altar in it. Twelve men were serving at the altar as priests, offering sacrifices to what they vaguely called a name. A multitude of people, including the disciples, were offering devotions at the altar. This is what the cover on my book shows. The priests who offered these sacrifices would bless and show humility to one another, but their behavior was contradictory. They engaged in pious fasting, but they also killed their own children and committed sexual sins. Hello. These priests invoked the name of Jesus at the altar, and they were making so many sacrifices that the altar was full of slaughtered animals. The disciples are disturbed by what they saw in their nightmare, and they fall into silence after they have told Jesus about it. Jesus's interpretation of the nightmare is shocking. He tells the disciples, it is you who receive the offerings at the altar that you saw. That is the God that you serve, and you are the 12 men whom you saw. And the cattle that are brought in are the sacrifices that you saw, that is, the multitude that you are leading astray at that altar. In other words, the disciples' vision was of the emerging Orthodox Church, which is leading followers to their spiritual deaths. By the middle of the second century, when the Gospel of Judas was written, 
some Christians had begun to compare the weekly Christian ritual of the Eucharist to the sacrifices that had been made in the temple in Jerusalem. Until the Romans destroyed the temple in the year 70, Jews brought animals to the temple to sacrifice to God, sometimes in thanksgiving and sometimes as atonement for sins. A tribe of sacred priests, the descendants of Aaron, offered these sacrifices on behalf of the people. After the destruction of the temple in 70, some Christians began to depict their Eucharist as the replacement or continuation of worship in the temple. At the Eucharist, Christians brought bread and wine, which they offered to God with prayers and thanksgiving. This bread and wine became the body and blood of Christ, and the ceremony commemorated Christ's death on the cross, which was a sacrifice for the sins of humanity. The Eucharist, in the view of some Christians, reenacted that sacrifice of Christ's body. And so the Christian leaders who presided over this ritual were like priests, bringing the offerings of the people to God. Not only this, but they claimed that the Christian clergy were the successors of the apostles. Just as the Jewish priests of the temple had been successors to Moses' brother Aaron, so too the Christian priests were successors to Jesus' apostles, Peter and the others. Now, I should be clear that this way of understanding the clergy and the Eucharist was by no means universal among Christians in the 100s. It would take centuries for this spirituality to become dominant all over the Christian world. But we do find Christian sources in major cities like Rome and Antioch presenting Christian worship in this way starting around the year 100. <laughs> the Gospel of Judas attacks this view harshly. As the disciples' nightmare has it, the Christian clergy may bless each other and treat each other with humility, but they also commit terrible sins. The sacrifice they claim to be offering they make to the wrong God. And who's really being sacrificed here is not any animal, but human beings, the people that tragically follow them in their erroneous teaching. Everything they do in the name of Jesus, but Jesus will have none of it. In my name, he says, they have shamefully planted fruitless trees. The gospel condemns the original disciples and the later Christian clergy who claim to be their successors as misguided sinners who can never know the truth. Jesus says to them, no race from the people among you will know me. But what about Judas? He does know the truth, as his original confession indicates, and Jesus explains the complete truth about reality to him. And yet Jesus also tells him that he will not enter the kingdom, but he will be grieved. The first editors and translators of the Gospel of Judas suggested that this was a gospel in which Judas is the hero, the model for those who are saved. But other scholars quickly pointed to passages that don't show Judas so positively. Not only will he not enter the kingdom and be grieved, but at one point Jesus calls Judas the 13th demon. Judas, just as he does in the New Testament gospels, plays a paradoxical role. In the New Testament, Judas betrays Jesus, and all the Gospels condemn him for this. They claim that Satan inspired him or that he did it for money. And yet, at the same time, what Judas did was necessary, part of God's plan for the salvation of humanity. Judas does what he must do. The Gospel of Judas takes a similar view. On the one hand, Jesus tells Judas, you will sacrifice the human being who bears me. Sacrifice is never good in this gospel, so I don't think Judas sacrificing the human Jesus is good either. Notice that Jesus refers to the human being who bears me. In this way, he makes clear that he, the divine savior from the Barbelo, is distinct from the human being in which he dwells. Only the latter will be killed, but it's still a bad thing. On the other hand, Judas's action will set in motion a series of events that will lead to the end of Yaldaba Oath and his fellow rulers and the reorganization of this universe with Judas as its new rulers. Thanks to Judas, says Jesus, Jesus, the kings have become weak, the races of angels have grieved, and the ruler is destroyed. In contrast, the great race of Adam, the human beings who have true knowledge of God, will be elevated to their true home with the divine beings above this world. This is good news for the saved people. And yet, this cosmos will not be entirely destroyed. Yaldabaoth and his rulers will be gone, but a new regime will administer the material realm, a new regime led by Judas. 
when Jesus calls Judas the 13th demon, demon, he's indicating the position that Judas will come to hold in the future cosmos. Right now, the heavens are ruled by 12 angels and 12 heavens over whom Yaldabaoth presides. The number 12 most likely reflects the zodiac as well as the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. Judas's position as 13th indicates that he'll take over the lead role in this universe. He'll replace Yaldabaoth as the god of this cosmos, a promotion to be sure, but not to heaven where the saved people will be. Jesus admits that Judas will be hated for what he has done, but Judas will rule over those who hate him. You will become the 13th, Jesus tells him, and you will be cursed by the rest of the races and you will be ruling over them. Again, it's helpful to compare this with something we find in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 19, Jesus tells the 12 disciples that they will play a leading role in the end of this world and the birth of the new kingdom of God. You will sit on 12 thrones, Jesus says to them, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. In the Gospel of Judas, Jesus tells Judas that he will preside even higher. He'll be the 13th ruling over everyone else, even those who now curse him for his act of betrayal. Judas will not enter the kingdom, that is, he won't leave this universe and dwell with the truly spiritual beings, and this fate may grieve him. Nonetheless, Judas has an essential role to play in the drama of salvation. By sacrificing the human being who bears the divine savior, Judas will bring about the disillusion of the current unjust world order and inaugurate a new regime in this universe, one that he will rule as the 13th demon. After Jesus reveals all this amazing information to Judas, he enters a luminous cloud, but the next thing we know, Jesus is in the upper room of the house where he shared the Last Supper with the disciples, and he's praying with, him, with them. Outside, Judas meets with some Jewish scribes. The scribes approach Judas and ask, what are you doing here? You're Jesus's disciple. The author then says that G Judas answered them as they wished, and Judas took money and handed him over to them. And with these words, the gospel ends, and gives the title. The ending seems rather anticlimactic, but it sends the reader back to the New Testament Gospels for the rest of the story. In effect, the Gospel of Judas tells its readers, now you know the real truth about who Jesus is and who his God is, so that you can now reread Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John with true understanding. The Gospel of Judas is more than an alternative to the New Testament Gospels. It seeks to be a correction of them. It gives you what it presents as the true understanding of the Gospels, their newly revealed Gnostic meaning. In this way, you, the reader, are offered the opportunity to escape the fate of Peter and the disciples and become a member of the undominated race that has true knowledge or gnosis. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions and your comments. Thank you, David, so very much uh, for that really fascinating talk and, and exploration of uh, the Gospel of Judas. Um, we've had some questions come in. If uh, any of you have questions that you'd like to ask, please uh, put them into the, uh, the Q&A and uh, we'll do our best to kind of make our way through them. Um, let me start with a couple that have come in while you were, while you were talking. Um, the first is a question uh, from Fraser Daniel, which is, uh, about uh, really about Gnosticism. And, and I wonder if you might actually use this question as uh, to offer a little bit of background on Gnosticism in general for those who are less familiar with it. Um, but he asks, how useful is the category of Gnostic since the Gnostics uh, and Proto-Orthodox hold to many things in common? John's gospel uh, thinks of Jesus descending from the realm of the Ho Theos, the high God, he walks through the world untainted by the darkness of the world and gives true knowledge to his followers. Early church follower, fathers also draw from a platonic idea of emanation uh, and God being the one and good. So um, thoughts on that, David? Yes, thanks for that question. That's really great. Um, actually, the use of the term Gnostic and Gnosticism for the people we've been talking about is a matter of great controversy among historians right now for precisely the reasons uh, that you mentioned, Daniel. That is that, um, you know, they share many views with other uh, Christians as well. And, um, you know, the term Gnostic and Gnosticism has often been used by um, 
uh, people in antiquity and today to kind of stigmatize and ostracize Christians who hold certain kinds of beliefs, right? Um, so I myself am not particularly wedded to that term as the one to use for the kinds of people that that the Gospel of Judas represents. Um, but I do think, and this, this is one where I and other historians would probably have a debate, I do think that there is good evidence that there was in fact a group of Christians in the 100s and 200s that did refer to themselves as Gnostics and that the Gospel of Judas comes from them and represents their views. Um, but and, and also, in, so anyway, that's why I still use the term. But we should also notice that other Christians who are certainly Orthodox also use the term Gnostic because it means one who has knowledge, which is a great thing. We'd all like to be that. So it's used not only in this kind of sectarian self-identifying sense, but also used by other Orthodox Christians for kind of the paradigmatic ideal Christian who really knows, knows truth. But um, yeah. It's, uh, it can, the term Gnostic can set people off too far away from Christians. That's why I kept saying Gnostic Christians, because they certainly are such. So we had a question come in um, about um, sort of the authoritative nature of this gospel of Judas. And I guess the mm -hmm. question really is why, so why is this gospel not included in the Bible? What's the process by which that, that happened? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and yes, why, why does it have less kind of authoritativeness uh, than, than, uh, than the standard ones? Right. Well, um, I do hope that maybe the theological issue I talked about may make clear why it's not in the Bible. I mean, at some point, Christians, um, the vast majority decided that, yes, Jesus actually is um, sent from, come from the son of the God of the Old Testament, who's the father, and um, not from some higher God. In other words, most Christians rejected um, the views that the Gnostics um, expounded. Um, and so as they began to collect and um, eventually make a New Testament from the works that they considered authoritative, these kinds of theological criteria definitely played a role. Um, we do have evidence. So as we said, got the, in the, we know in the middle of the 100s, there were Gnostics who circulated the Gospel of Judas and apparently thought it was important. Um, we have also people in the 300s and 400s who refer to Gnostics having a Gospel of Judas, though this is less certain whether um, this is still the case or they're just repeating what Irenaeus had said 200 years earlier and we're just reading it. Um, but yes, I think you can see that um, its ideas were out there enough that it, they were eventually rejected. And also a gospel attributed to Judas Iscariot probably in the end wasn't going to be that popular anyway. But the process of forming the New Testament is a kind of long and involved thing that really only finalized in the mid to late fourth century, the mid to late 300s. But the set of four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we can see Christians talking about already in the late 100s. In fact, that Irenaeus who we met, he's one of the first people who says, you should, these are the four gospels and, and this is it. So it was a complicated process, but in this case, it's probably due to both its association with Judas Iscariot, who no one really liked very much, and its theological assertions, which most Christians came to reject. Wonderful. We've had several questions about whether the um, the, the kind of slides uh, and and from this uh, presentation and the, the the webinar itself will be available uh, later on. I just want to to say yes, indeed, we will send out uh, an uh, an email to to everyone who has signed up uh, with uh, with a link to the recording of this event, and so you'll be able to go back uh, back through those uh, at your leisure uh, later on. Um, we have a question from uh, Emma Montgomery, uh, who'd like to know, why would the Gnostics choose to use Judas as the contrast to Peter uh, and the vehicle through which they would promote the secret knowledge of their own version of Christianity? Could they not have used another figure in Christianity or introduced their own? Great question, Emma. Thank you so much. Um, there are other Gnostic works from the same group that attribute their teachings to other authoritative figures. So Judas is not the kind of mascot for the Gnostics always. So for example, one of their other major works 
is called the secret book according to John, by which they mean the apostle John, right? And another Gnostic work called The Reality of the Rulers actually cites Paul, St. Paul, right? So they did look to other Gnostics cited other people. Why in this case, Judas? Um, well, I think Irenaeus tells us about the Gnostics who published Judas, that they actually valued and promoted other figures in the Bible in the Old Testament, like Cain, you know, Cain who killed Abel and was therefore kind of punished by the God of the Old Testament, that they highlighted as virtuous and role models characters like this. Um, because as you can imagine, because they see the God of the Old Testament is kind of a hostile God, they see figures in the Old Testament that that God went after and was mean to, if you want to put it that way, as as good people, right? And so some of that is the same logic that carries over to Judas. Judas is vilified by other Christians, and therefore he must have a clue. Um, but I think in the end, the other thing to add to this is simply um, they are trying to understand, just as other Christians were, why did G Judas do this? Why would, you know, betray Jesus? Why was this necessary? And, um, and they felt as though, rather than just being inspired by Satan or taking money, Judas must have known what Jesus was really about. And that's why he did this necessary thing. So I think in the end, they don't want to, and it's very important in the gospel, unlike some other kind of dialogue gospels, Judas isn't promoted as the source of revelation for others. It's not like you should listen to this gospel because it comes from Judas. Instead, this is the information Judas receives in order to do what he needs to do, that is to sacrifice the human being who bears Jesus. So he gets the information he needs, as do we, by reading the gospel. Um, but I think that's what they're interested in. And so this is a great example of a kind of stream of interpretations of Judas that continue to the present day in which people retell this story and think that Judas must have had motivations other than just being bad and wanting money. And, uh, you know, if we had more time, it would be fun to do a whole webinar on like Judas and contemporary Jesus movies of the 20th century, because they often ascribe to Judas various, even noble motives. Um, for what he did. And I think this is more in that tradition than it is holding up Judas as a model for whom we all should follow. Great question, though. Thanks, David. We, we have several questions. We have, in fact, lots of questions that have come in. So you bring a couple together here that uh, are looking at sort of the reception of, uh, the, uh, of the gospel, how people responded to it. So we have a question about, do we have any sense of how um, the the sort of more, the Orthodox Christians responded to uh, to this gospel. Uh, we have a question about: Is there any way to know how large a following this gospel had, um, and what what kept it from growing as large as more traditional uh, Christian thinking? Um, and then we have a question related to this: Is that are there are there other references to the Gospel of Judas between 180 CE and 2006, or was it really sort of lost for all these years? So just, I, I think questions all around the sort of presence and, and uh, of this in, in the broader culture and its reception. Okay, so um, let's first talk about the survival of it as a text, right? And um, obviously no copy of the original Greek has survived, right? Um, which shows that at some point, Christians stopped copying it, uh, most likely because it was of no one wanted it. I mean, it was of no use. I mean, if if it wasn't authoritative for your group, there was no, in antiquity to copy something was a big deal. You had to, you know, hire someone and buy the paper and they have to do, you know, and it's a skill and so forth. So uh, it's not like us, you know, taking something to a photocopy machine or making a PDF, right? It was a big deal. So, um, so part of that is um, just, you know, people stopped using it. Now, at some point, someone translated it from Greek into Coptic, which is the last stage of the Egyptian language in Egypt, right? Um, and yeah, so that's how we have it. Uh, let me say something about references to it. We talked about Irenaeus in 180, right? The next reference to the Gospel of Judas doesn't come until the late 300s from a guy named Epiphanius, who also refers to 
um, Gnostic followers of Cain, of Cain and Abel, who publish a Gospel of Judas. And then there's a guy named Theodard of Cyrus who mentions it in the early 400s. And here's the thing, it's not quite clear whether they, and they would have, they did not read Coptic. So if they knew it, they had to know it in Greek. And so it means it would still have been circulating in Greek in the late 300s and early 400s. However, they don't say anything more about the Gospel of Judas than we read in Irenaeus. So we, it's very possible that they were just reading Irenaeus and repeating his information. You know, it's like, you know, we would repeat something we read in a book. Okay, so that's the survival and references to it. Um, and that's it, right? So our, our measure of how accepted it was by wider Christianity is its, um, you know, failure to survive and so forth. How many people would have been interested in this? This is a real problem because, of course, in the ancient world, we have no um, demographic information about anything. But the important thing to realize here is in the 100s, the number of Christians was very, very, very small, right, out of all the people in the Roman Empire. And so the subset of Christians who are into this idea must have also been very, very, very small, right? But on the flip side of that, that means that because there were so few Christians in this, you know, huge Roman Empire, they kind of knew about each other. <laughs> you know, they're a smaller group, and so they tend to fight and know what's going on. And uh, yeah, so there was a lot of um, rejection for these kinds of ideas, but what could they do? They didn't run, they didn't have any coercive powers to do anything about this. So usually it just meant they would break up into different groups, not talk to each other. The Gnostics would write books like the Gospel of Judas that said, you guys are wrong, right? And Irenaeus, when he mentions the Gospel of Judas, it's part of a whole book that's about how Christians like the Gnostics are themselves also wrong. So there was just a lot of fighting about this, and then it's in the 300s after Constantine becomes emperor, the Roman emperor, that Christians can be a little bit more um, effective in uh, controlling what is taught and so forth. But the gist of it is to say that, um, you know, there isn't a lot of surviving reactions to the Gospel of Judas specifically, but there's lots of surviving condemnation and um, and uh, invective against the ideas that you find in the Gospel of Judas. Great. Uh, we have a lot of questions about the process of actually finding the text and mm -hmm. also the sort of the the structures of the text and the physical um, uh, kind of makeup of the text. Uh, let me put those all together for you, hopefully in a nice little package. Um, so one of our, our artists asked, you know, can you talk more about the context for the discovery of the manuscript? The combination of Coptic and Greek, religious and mathematical text is interesting. Are there other similar sites nearby or theories about the provenance? We had another question about who, who exactly found it and who has authenticated uh, the text. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question about what, uh, what material is the gospel written upon? Mm -hmm. And then we have questions about the sort of structure of the codex. Uh, right. Does it follow similar patterns to other codices uh, from, uh, from that time? Okay, um, I'm going to share my screen again so that we can look at, um, go all the way back. Okay, so um, the place where it was found, as we said, is near Almenia. Here's the thing. Um, the account of its discovery, which we think was in the late 1970s, is very murky. And uh, the only book that really talks about it bases its description of the discovery on interviews with people, most of whom are given pseudonyms, and everyone else has pseudonyms. That's because of the kind of bad handling of it afterwards. So people don't want to be named. So the exact circumstances of its discovery, we think in a cave, right, is not particularly well known. Okay. Um, now, as I said, it was found with other books. It is um, this and the other books that are found are all papyrus, right, which is um, a paper material that is made from a plant. So the gospel, the codex, as it's called now, Codex Chacos, 
which you see here, um, has been radiocarbon dated, which gives a range of possible dates from about 250 to about uh, 450. You know, it only can give a big range, right? Um, but uh, examination of the script and so on uh, makes us pretty confident it comes from the 300s. It resembles other texts. We have no, because of the ill-reported um, uh, circumstances of the discovery, we have no real, we don't know the exact place. And so we have no archaeological context for it. Um, somewhat similar, but a little different is you've probably heard discovered at Nag Hammadi in the middle of the 20th century were uh, 13 codices that also contain works from Gnostic Christians, but also from other Christians and people who aren't Christian and aren't Gnostic and so forth. Um, so that's a bunch. So, but you see the the distance between these two places. So uh, the whole thing does not survive. So we don't know how many pages in the end it had. Um, one estimate is that it may have had as many as 180 pages, which would make it a pretty expensive book to produce. You can see how crumbly and everything it is. Uh, just to say in brief, um, uh, you know, it spent years, at least a decade, simply stuck in a safe deposit box in a bank on Long Island. Um, a antiquities dealer in Ohio decided to preserve it by putting it in a freezer. And of course, this is organic material. So freezing and then thawing, you know, think about when you buy like lunch meat ham at the grocery store and then you freeze it and and you thaw it out and it's all wet right that's what happened with this so it's all I mean the whole thing is just horrible um so we can't even reconstruct exactly how many pages it had we know it had a total of at least five different texts in it because we have some of the other texts right um why would there be I know these are lots of questions. Why would there be these other, like a mathematical text? Probably it was just some really educated person. And uh, Egypt in the late ancient period in the fourth century was a bilingual society. People, um, many people knew both Greek, which was kind of the official language of business and commerce and so forth, and Coptic, which is kind of like the you know, local language or whatever. And so um, a lot of people more educated, especially would be, a be able to move between these languages, both Greek and Coptic, right? Um, we could go into a whole thing about then why were these things translated into Coptic? This is a fascinating question. Who might have owned this? We know the owner of, or the person who commissioned, because you had to say, I want this codex made and go to someone who could make it. We know the producer and the owner of the codex was Christian because it has like crosses, decorative crosses on it and other kinds of indication of Christianness. Some people say these people must have been monks, but you know, there were lots of educated folks interested in reading things. So all of this is to say it's a, most of it is still a great mystery. Um, uh, exactly who owned this, why, even the extent, um, you know, we keep hoping that more fragments will turn up. Um, you know, as they did in 2010. In fact, I this book I just published, I was given the contract to do it in 2010. And they said, when are you going to turn it in? I said, how about 2020? And they were like, 10 years. And I said, I just want to make sure no more fragments come out before I publish this book uh, or appear or surface or get discovered or whatever. And so finally, I had to write it. So now if new, uh, you know, they may discover all new fragments tomorrow that mean that everything I just said may not be correct. But I've tried to <laughs> stick to that. So anyway, I'm sorry. That was a little bit longer than I should have been in that answer. But it's really interesting but we don't know enough as we should about the the codex itself. Um, David, I think I'm going to sneak in one more kind of little package of questions, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm going to try. There's there's been multiple there's multiple questions, and my apologies to those whose questions we're not going to get to. Um, but we've had multiple questions about sort of the ideas found um, found in this in this gospel. Uh, so. And I'm, I'm going to put them all together, even though they're not exactly related. Um, but uh, so one of our members asked, what is the relationship between the Gnostics and the practice of Kabbalah? The idea of divine emanation seems rather similar. Mm -hmm. um, 
Another asks, back then were demons bad? Were angels and demons the same concept? Did the disciples become evil demons? Mm -hmm. And then another asking, um, would the proto-Orthodox, <coughs> excuse me, have regarded the Hotheos uh, as the same as Hashem or something altogether different? Um, great questions. Let me be really quick. <laughs> yes, the Gnostic ideas look like Kabbalah and other strains of kind of Jewish mystical contemplation and esoteric stuff. We are not sure uh, whether there's any kind of genetic connection, you know, that there was a continuing stream of knowledge. Instead, um, I think they are independent, but similar responses to the entire problem of how can the ultimate God the God who says through a burning bush to Moses, I am who I am, you know, and what is that, right? How can that God be both known and unknowable at the same time? And the idea of kind of God emanating or having, you know, lower versions of God's self emerge from him is a way that both Jews and Christians in various forms came up with. And that's kind of where the Trinity originates is that idea. God had to emanate his son so that we could know God. Okay, um, angels and demons, great question. It, in antiquity, daimons, demons, for most people could be either good or bad. But for Jews and Christians, they rapidly became just bad. So it's unlikely, so when it's applied to Judas, it's probably a negative term in some way, right? Um, angels is an interesting thing because in this gospel, the term angel is used for kind of good divine beings and bad divine beings. But see that it has much more precedent in the New Testament. In the New Testament, there are references to good angels and references to evil angels. So it's a term that kind of refers to beings that exist, both demons and angels, between us and God. They're not God. They're not us. They're higher on the totem pole of ontology or being, right? But in Christian usage, demon becomes uniformly used in a negative way, while angels retains an ambiguity. That is, there can be bad angels, right? You find this usage even in the New Testament, right? I think I did all that. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, David. I, um, I think we have put you through your paces and we've uh, through this uh, this hour. And so I, I wanted to uh, thank you all very much for for joining us today. I'm particularly grateful to Professor uh, David Brackey for sharing his expertise uh, and his passion for history. Uh, please join me in giving him a virtual round of applause. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, David. Um, and we'd also like to thank the College of Arts and Sciences at Ohio State, especially Jade Lack and Maddie Kerma, and also the History Department, the Harvey Goldberg Center for Excellence in Teaching, the Cleo Society, the Bexley Public Library, and the magazine Origins, Current Events, and Historical Perspective for their sponsorship. And once again, thank you, our audience, for your excellent questions and ongoing connection to Ohio State. Stay safe and healthy, and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.